Good stuff. <clears throat> Morning, church. Morning. I want to welcome you, whether you are here in physical presence or whether you are with us in virtual presence, we are together, and it is good to be together. This is the day the Lord's made. We rejoice, and we're glad in it. So I want to encourage you to do uh, one thing for me, and if you are using a bulletin, it's not going to be right, and if you're, whether you're online or whether you're here, I want you to find three scripture texts that we're going to consider a little bit later. Here's the first, Psalm 139, second, Matthew chapter 11, Psalm 139, Matthew chapter 11, Romans chapter 12. We're going to come to them a little bit later in our worship. I'm Jim Wood. I'm a forgiven sinner. I love Jesus as my Savior and my Lord, and I want to welcome you to my family today. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. This is what Psalm 139 says to us this morning as it calls us to worship. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Sisters and brothers, let us worship our God.
amazing grace How sweet the sound That saved the wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found I was blind But now I see It was grace was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fear to read. How precious did that grace appear? The hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free My God, my Savior, you ransom me And like a flood, His mercy reigns Unending love, amazing grace And my chains are gone you're here on this snowy sleety morning and we hope that you're watching at home with us from your pajamas if you are watching at home connect with us online so we can reach out this week look right above where you're watching you'll see the connection card and you can connect there if you're here in person there's an envelope on your chair you can just fill it out put your ties and your offerings right in the envelope you also can text to give um, each week we talk about it it's so easy I know that you're all texting each other 530-5683, you put the word give in the text line, the amount, once you hit submit, it will auto-enroll and you can give that way going forward. If you need your offering envelopes for 2021, you can request them on the connection card if you're watching at home and Shelby will send them to you or you can pick them up right outside in the common. Thanks. Okay, I want to encourage you to consider, we, we say we're seeking Christ and sharing his love, so we want to give you opportunities to do both of that this week. So the first is our master classes are continuing. They're fantastic. We bring somebody in with some expertise in an area. The classes are virtual. They're from seven to eight, and uh, I found them just to be an amazing gift and blessing. We're covering all kinds of things. So this Wednesday, I'm going to do a master class 
on cultural Christianity or the real stuff. <clears throat> and the subtitle is, Where Does the South End and Christianity Begin? So it should be a, a great opportunity and fun time for us to be together and consider that. And then this Thursday, uh, Robin Coward is going to do a master class on one year later, Mourning Our Pandemic Losses. And uh, Robin is just a He's so renowned in this area of being able to offer a model for grief and loss support as a resource to help us better understand um, how one has to mourn well in order to <clears throat> live well and love well. And so it's an opportunity for us, not only in our mourning, but to be able to be with others in there. So please consider that. It uh, should be a great opportunity. And then we say we not only seek Christ, but we share his love. So a couple of very specific opportunities for us today. The first is today is the uh, Celebrate Life Day for us. And let's show a little thing from the Crisis Pregnancy Center who's doing some great stuff. I'm glad Kathy is Luna's mom. Kathy is very strong to go through all of this because she's very young. It's very great that the Kime Center and places like that are around because if you get pregnant at a young age, you're really lost and you don't know what to do. If you're thinking about donating to CBC, it will make an impact because you're helping younger females who are in need of help. I could imagine a world without Luna, but I wouldn't want to because I just, my world's better with Luna. I feel like she could change the world. The Crisis Pregnancy Center is doing some great stuff in our own local community, and we want to support it as a congregation. We want you to support it as well. So many of you brought in those baby bottles and put money, cash, and checks in it. That's great. Uh, there's still opportunities to be able to support them directly, as you saw that link, or you can uh, do it through the church. And as you give, just note that you want it to go as a contribution to Crisis Pregnancy Center, and we will, we will accomplish that for you. So wonderful things. And let's see... Now is an opportunity for us to turn to God's Word. So if you've got your scriptures found, <clears throat> tell them to you again. Psalm 139, Matthew chapter 11, Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> now Psalm 139, without question, is um, my psalm. It's the one that I go to over and over and over more than any of the others. Um, I have proof of that for, for a number of years, actually. It was the only psalm that I played as a song in my, um, uh, in my study for years. Um, it's just, it speaks to me. So I'm going to read the first 19 verses of Psalm 139 for us. <clears throat> a little bit of context, I think, is important. This says in the, in the caption, it says, For the director of music of David, a psalm. So, I'm not sure that we always remember this, but the Psalms were sung, so they, they, were, they were musical. And uh, David writes this song, and he, he's the librettist. He writes the words, and then he takes it to the music director, and he says, okay, turn it into a song for me. So I can only imagine how intimidating it is to have the king come to you <clears throat> and say, make what I wrote sound really good as a song. So Brian, we're going to talk about that somewhere along the way. It's, it's got to be overwhelmingly intimidating. Now, the idea that, <clears throat> that the Psalms were songs actually carries forward in the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, because in the early tradition of the Reformed Presbyterian tradition, the only music that was ever sung in the, sung in the sanctuary ever were, were the Psalms, nothing else. And it's just really over time that the Methodists kind of take an influence because they've got this great music and then we started adding other things. In the traditional service, we've got something that we say is the doxology. But if you look at it in the notes, it actually says the old hundredth. John Calvin wrote that, sort of the, the first founder of, in a sense, of our tradition. He wrote it and set it to, he set the music um, to, uh, to uh, Psalm 100. So, uh, so this would be sung. But today, I'm going to read it. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. 
You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the, dark, the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You saw my unformed body, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 12. A little bit of context here is important. You've heard me say this before, but Romans is the only letter that Paul wrote to a church that either he didn't found or he did not have someone... um, active as a, as a partner in ministry there. So this is a, an introduction. It's the fullest explication of his theology. In the first 11 chapters, Paul's building out an argument for Christ, a beautiful apologetic. And then in the 12th chapter, he moves to the application. And so this, therefore, is really important at the very first verse. I'm going to read the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. Listen again for the word of the Lord. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And now, Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to pick up at verse 28. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. This is, uh, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to live so God can use me anytime, Lord, anytime. I'm going to live. That was angelic. 
I loved it. Maria and Michaela, that was beautiful. And Joyce did a beautiful job of putting that together and showing how our church works together to be the hands and feet of Christ. So Jim read um, our scriptures for today, and, and some of the scriptures were talking about being made in God's image and being fearfully and wonderfully made. And he also um, read a scripture about um, being a living sacrifice. And we have talked about that before um, in a children's sermon over the last year, but I want to reread Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. Do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his good pleasing, and perfect will. All right, so we've talked about um, a living sacrifice before and the fact that a sacrifice means to give something up and God calls us to use our gifts. So I've brought a gift basket for you today. And he talks about us using our gifts and our gifts might be um, singing, it might be playing the drums, it might be, um, it might be putting together music videos, um, it might be giving of your money. Um, but there were two, three words in here that made me rethink um, what this could mean. And so so at the beginning of Romans, it says, therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters. And so I thought about how can we be a living sacrifice as a body of Christ? So thinking about that, I brought you guys a present um, with lots of different colored tissues. I brought you some eggs because every kid would like to get that as a present. These are excellent. My friend Emily, her, um, her birds lay these eggs, chickens. Um, this is some salt. That's great. You could use that on your front porch this morning. Kids, don't you want to get these things on Christmas morning? Here is some oil. Let's see. We've got some flour. Oh, this is good. I mean, Arlie would love it if I gave her a bag of flour for Christmas. And then we have some sugar. So individually, these are pretty crummy presents, right? They're pretty crummy. Um, but collectively, they can make something magnificent. And so I went over to the Nest um, dessert table and I found where somebody, it was probably Miss Witten or um, um, the Johnsons that made chocolate chip cookies. So collectively, these ingredients could make something pretty tasty and wonderful like chocolate chip cookies. I saw cakes. I saw sugar cookies. Somebody made these. So it made me think that we each have our gifts and I've been thinking about the body of Christ and how we work so much better together than we do individually. And it made me think of nest and what happens here. And individually, we can do some okay things and some great things, but collectively, we can do awesome things. My friend Kelsey and Rochelle, they come every morning and get things cleaned up and they socialize and have meaningful relationships. Um, my friend Mindy comes a couple of times a week and works um, and gets all the clothes organized for me. We have folks that, um, that serve meals. We have folks that um, you guys after church today will help put all this together. And so collectively that's okay, but I mean, well, individually that's okay, but collectively it's magnificent. So we are called to not only be a living sacrifice, but to be God's church. And that is right here as we are serving others. So um, we can be okay on our own, but we can be magnificent together, and I've never seen a better example of that than what's happening here at Nest as we're serving our friends out in the community. So I'm going to close this in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the privilege that we have to be here, and thank you for the privilege that you have made us unique in your image, Lord, and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, Lord. And thank you for the privilege that we have not only to be a living sacrifice um, as each individuals, whether it's our gifts of time and service, or maybe our gifts of our talents, Lord, but we have the privilege to be a living sacrifice together as brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can do magnificent things in your honor and in your image. In your heavenly name, amen. Good stuff. Thanks, Hunter. Um, I want to ask you a question this morning, and then I want to talk about the question. <laughs> Uh, so, so here's the question um, I'm asking this morning. What's on your heart? If you just take a moment, whether you are here or you're, you're there, um, what's on your heart? What's on your heart? Now, um, 
as you contemplate that, I want, I want to talk about the question. Um, what's on your heart is, is we all understand. I'm really asking you what's, what really matters. What's, what, you know, I'm doing this, right? I mean, what, what really matters? What's, what's real, true, what's important to you? You know, th those kinds of things, right? Um, it really kind of gets to the question of what makes a human, right? I mean, is it, you know, what, what defines a human? Because when I'm asking you what's on your heart, I'm really trying to get at what's the deepest part in your, human, in your humanness, you know? So, so I, I was thinking about that. Uh, what's the Bible say about what makes a human? Uh, well, it's really easy. It's in the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, and you remember what God does. God takes... God comes and, and takes the, the, the river mud, the slime, and then God molds it, and then God takes his breath and breathes his breath into this clay, and, and the first human being is made. Now, now just think about that. I mean, you know, you've got the you've got this sense of of mud, right, this sort of inanimate, and then, and then God's breath. And the, the Hebrew word is ruach, it means breath, wind, spirit. Now the Bible talks about that in, in a variety of different ways. Not only does it tell that story, but it, it, it actually talks about um, <clears throat> the things that make us human in a sense being in our bowels. Um, and you, you do this as well. We talk about it, you know, in my gut I feel. Uh, and and there's, there's something in that that works for us because there are times, right, when you really do feel something in your gut. I mean, it's just like it, uh, something that gets there, right? It's the same thing. So the Bible also talks about our heart. You know, what is it that what, what our heart is, 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 is here because we can feel it, you know, we can feel our, our pulse change, you know, and our heartbeat. I mean, you know, that there's, there's, something, there's something that's in that. Now, we know that both of the, neither one of those is where our, where our soul or spirit rests, um, you know, it's, many of us try to put it in our mind, but interesting, Aristotle actually thought that the brain was a cooling device, um, if you think about the way it looks. But, but for us, the, the truth is simple. It's, it's mud, and it's the Spirit of God. But it's more than that, right? So from the very beginning to the very end of this book, this Bible, this is what it says about life. It says that life is eternal. Now, now I want to be really clear about that. It's It's eternal. Well, let me, let me read what Psalm 139 says. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is, a, this is not just a psalm, not just a song, but... But, but this is what we find throughout Scripture, is that, is that our life is, is not only, it's not only our, our, our mind and our spirit and, and our flesh here, but life is eternal. Now, now here's, here's what's interesting in this, is that what we do is we usually think that eternal life is where you're going, right? We say, okay, well, I'm alive now, and then I'm going to get to heaven, and then that's eternal life. But no, no, that's not what eternal is. Eternal has no beginning and no ending. Eternal means that, that we have always, in some sense, that there's parts, there's, there, there's this, this spirit of us, sometimes we want to call it a soul, but, but, there, but we have existed. We were, even before I was formed in my mother's womb, God knew me, God had a purpose for me. I, I was, that, that's what it is to be eternal. And, and, when, and when, when, when what we live now, we, we live with, with mud and clay, and so, it, and so it, 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 it makes it hard for us to recognize, but, but it but, but, but our life is eternal. It was, it was before we were made, and it's after we were made. And, and that's overwhelmingly significant, because what, what the Bible is saying is, is that we are created in the image of God. Every single person is created in the image of God. This is what it is to be in the image of God. It's to have the Spirit of God within us. The Spirit of God that didn't exist when the world was made, the Spirit of God hovered over the depths, was there, was there eternally. And so the sanctity of life for us it is, is from womb to tomb and beyond and before. It, it, it's, it's overwhelmingly critical for us as believers to understand this, is that, is that the sanctity of life is not limited to one particular topic or one particular issue, as important as it may be, that, that it is speaking about the entirety of our life. It, it's realizing the eternal nature in, in us. I'll give you an example. The early church, the first three centuries of the early church. So the early church went from Pentecost to having 3,000 believers. Well, it went from... 
you know, just a few, to 3,000 Pentecost, and 300 years later, there's 6 million Christians. Now, here's the thing that's really intriguing about that, is that for those 300 years, the church was overwhelmingly persecuted. Now, I'm not just talking about like it was illegal, yet, though it was. I mean, it's persecuted. Here's what they do with the Christians. They try to get the Christians to fight. Christians wouldn't fight. Try to get them to be gladiators. They just stand there. They get killed. That's no fun. So here's what they decided to do. Well, let's create a new way for entertainment. So we'll bring lions in. The Christians, they fed them to the lions. We, 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 were, we were burned at the stake. We were, we, we, we were, we were for, for 300 years, we, we, had, we were overwhelmingly persecuted from, 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 the, from, the, <laughs> from beginning to end. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely clear. I mean, our history shows us this over and over and over. But you know the thing that's amazing? Is that in the midst of that, the Christians had no enemies. Here's what I mean by that. They were being persecuted, they were being killed, they were being, they were, they were being used for game and fodder and all of that, but they had no enemies. Because Christians believed they had one enemy, that was Satan, the adversary, evil. And everyone else they saw as being created in the image of God, even those who persecuted them, even those who were leading them to the slaughter, they saw them as the image of God. And so they did not see them as enemies. They, 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 they saw them as the image of God, and they believed that even in their death, even in their persecution, that there was this opportunity that there was within them to be able to proclaim the goodness of God even to the people that were killing them. Can you imagine that? Well, the church did for 300 years. It imagined, and it still does to this day in many parts of this world that we cannot even begin to fathom. It's recognized in the beginning with this, with this idea that, that, that not, just, not just are these words in Psalm 139 or these words just for me or, 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 or for us as the believers, but, but these words are true for everyone. Now, now this, this living this way with no enemies, this living this way in the midst of persecution and yet faithfulness, this living this way in, in, the, in, the, in the reality of eternity is what we call sanctification. So, so the theologians have kind of two big words. One's justification, and that means how we're saved, and we're saved by Christ and Christ alone, right? And then sanctification, it's, it's, it's how we live. It's not, it's not about how we're saved, but, it, but it's about how we live. It's really in, in some, some, some branches within the Christian faith call it the process of holiness. So, so how, do we, how do we live these kinds of lives like the early church did? Paul's language is, is this in Romans. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And now here's the word, conformed. The word conformed is scheme. Don't be part of the scheme, the schema, the schematic. But be transformed. So don't be part of just, just kind of doing the best you can in the framework you have, but be transformed. That word is metamorphosis. Take on a new life. It's what, what Jesus is really saying with Nicodemus in that discussion in John where where Nicodemus, you know, comes to Jesus in the middle of the night and says, you know, hey, what is it to be born again? And, you know, Jesus uses a different kind of language. He really talks about being born from above or being born afresh. And so, and so, so this call for us and how we live is, is absolutely critical, right? How, how, do I, how do I become the kind of person like the early church was? How do I, how do I realize that I have no enemies? How do I live in, in seeing the sanctity of life from the womb to the tomb for all the created order? How do I do this? Well, it, well you know, that, that's hard, but it's really easy. It's super easy. Just look at Jesus, right? I mean, Jesus did it, and, and let's, let's, let's look at Jesus. So if you go to, to Matthew chapter 11... Let me show you something that I think is absolutely uh, astounding. Um, D.L. Moody, a century or more ago, um, said that, um, that this passage in, um, in, in Matthew is the only time in all four of the Gospels that Jesus says what's on his heart. <laughs> um, I, I got a great recommendation for you. It's a book by Dane Ortland called Gentle and Lowly. It came out last year. Um, it has been such a beautiful, it's, it's just a beautiful explication of this verse, how it builds out in so many different ways. So let me, let me go back to that verse in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now the yoke is a, is a, is a, is a, a wooden beam that goes between two oxen, now two horses. And, and the yoke is designed to be able to help uh, those, those two animals, those two beasts of burdens, to pull equally 
so, so that it can accomplish so much more. Because honestly, we know, right, when we're, when we're in unison, we can do so much more than not. But the yoke is designed to do this. I don't know if you've ever really thought about it. The yoke is designed to do this. When, when one beast, a burden, when one horse, when, when one oxen gets in front of the other, the yoke comes and it brings overwhelming pain to the other one. It hurts like holy fire. And, so, and, and it also hurts the one in front, and so they learn to go together. So this is the image of a yoke. So, so let me go back. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, what Jesus is saying is, he's saying, come and learn from me and come and, 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 and take my yoke, which is not going to bring pain to you, but it's going to enable you to come and, 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 and be with me. It's going to pull us forward together. It's an amazing privilege. It's, it's what it is to be called in ministry with, with Jesus. It's, I mean, it's overwhelming when you think about it. And so in the midst of this is the only time in all of the Gospels that Jesus ever says what's on his heart. He says this, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. We translated it as humble, but the word is really not really humble. There's another word for humble. It means lowly. It's this. It means it, at, from the very bottom. I am gentle and I am from the very bottom. And here's what Jesus is saying. There's no place you've been there's no place you are that I haven't been with you. I come from the bottom. And everything that is, is where I am. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest in your souls. And, and so, so what Jesus is saying in this passage is, is He's saying, come and let me show you, let me teach you. And, and how does Jesus do it? Jesus does it by seeing the image of God in every single person. I mean, He sees them as created and it magnificently made, gloriously made. He, 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 I mean, it's, just, it's this Psalm 139 that Jesus is incarnating, that Jesus is living and showing. And, and, it, and it's an amazing when you start to think about it. And it starts to shift all of our understanding is that if we want to learn from Jesus, let's just interact with the ways people interacted with Jesus and Jesus interacts with them. Jesus didn't have enemies. He had people that were opposed to him, but he had no enemies. Because even in his conversation, even in those times where, where, where he's challenged, where they're trying to trick him, where they're trying to get him so that he can actually be worthy of being executed, Jesus is not, he, he's, he, he's not defiling them. He's not, he's not choosing to, to cast them aside. He's engaging. He's, he's working because what Jesus desires is for them to know him, for, for them to be saved. Jesus didn't come to save just those who knew him. He came, to, he, came, he came even more importantly, he came to save those who hated him, those who killed him. I mean, that's, he had no enemies. He had people that were opposed to him. He had people that would say he was their enemy, but he, had, he, saw, this, he saw the image of God in them. And this is, this is what is overwhelmingly critical for us, but it is so beautiful and simple. It's just as simple as that. How, how, do, I, how, do, I, how do I move in, in my own holiness of my life? How do I, how do I seek to, 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 to grow in, in, in who I am and, and, and how I follow this, this God, this Jesus who's gentle and lowly in heart. And I seek to see the same as he sees. To see the image of God in another. I've shared this with some of you before. Um, our NEST is what we, it's an acronym for, for our, uh, this homeless ministry. And we have 45 guests in this space every night, seven days a week, and turn it over for worship. And then a few minutes later, most of you will stay and turn it back over. And, um, so uh, not too long ago, um, a guy that I've known for a year, known, known since I've been here, uh, 20-something years, um, came to me and he said, Jim, I got to talk to you. I said, okay. So he was uh, volunteering at Nest, uh, this homeless ministry. And uh, he said, you know, Jim, I, I, uh, so I was in, uh, you know, I, I was supposed to go outside. I was supposed to go out to the line. Everybody's lined up. There's not always room for everybody, so people get turned away. They kind of crowd in, and I'm supposed to keep everybody socially distant. He says, you know, that's, as I know, that's almost impossible. It's just a challenge, right? Keep them six feet apart, you know. And, and he says, I go out, and, I'm, and, I, and I've been 30 years in the military, so I know, I, know how to, I know how to do this. And I walk out, and I start to put my big voice on, and, you know, and I'm, I'm engaging, and I'm friendly, but I put my big voice on, and I start to talk about, uh, I get ready to start talking about people having to move and socially distant. And then I look down, and there's this, there's this body that's on the ground, and all hooded and covered up and, and, and down. And I said, okay. And, and this, this face lifts up that, from this sort of shroud, looks up and looks at me, and Jim, 
I saw the face of Jesus. And, and he said, Jim, I'm like Presbyterian. <laughs> we don't see the face of Jesus, right? I mean, like, like he said, you know, Jim, I got to be honest with you. It scared the holy, it didn't scare the profanity out of him. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. That's what he said. He says it scared the holy out of me. He said, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to do with that. We sat down and we started talking and I said, you know, I said, here's the beautiful thing. I said, right, I mean, every, every single guest out there is not one, it's, it's all. And what you got was you got this amazing gift. The Holy Spirit gave you this amazing gift last night. The Holy Spirit said, I want you to see, I want you to see Jesus in, in one. So now you can look for Jesus in all. And I want you to trust and believe that, that, that these eyes that met your eyes, that confirm that for you, that it's the same in the other eyes, whether they're glazed with drugs or whether they're, they're gazed, you know, glazed with sin or, or, or with separation or pain or whatever it is. I mean, this is, this is what it is to, to, to be a follower of Jesus, is to seek, to desire. We can't always do it. It's not always there, but, but we know it's always there. It's not always here, but it's there, always, the image of God. And, and when, when I see that, then, then my life realizes that there's this amazing sanctity of life from the womb to the tomb. Even before I was formed in my mother's womb, God knew me, had a purpose for me. I existed. And just as when I die, the promises of life and life eternal are there. But you see, those promises are lived out now as well. I mean, this is the great power and the great beauty and the great joy. And so I want to go back and I want to go back to that question. I want to ask you again. I want to ask you right now again, what's on your heart? What's on your heart? And here's the second question. Is what's on your heart different than what it was 20 minutes ago? Because if it is, if the Spirit of God has spoken to you in, in some way, not, not through these words, but, but, but through through these words if the spirit of God has spoken to you in a way that that there's something different in your heart you're not even sure what it is but I, I there's a yearning there's a desire to be able to, to to be to be with this God who says I'm gentle and lowly in heart to be able to come and journey and, and, and work alongside with him in the yoke that is easy and yet powerful if, if, if something like that has just been even a little twinge within you, I have one more question for you. Who? Who today? Who do you need to see the image of God in? Jesus had no enemies. He had one, the adversary. Satan, the evil one. But he had no enemies. Because he died, he lived, he was resurrected. He promises to come again for those who opposed him. Who have you allowed to become an enemy? Who, 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 who have you allowed to become an issue? A problem, a purpose, a thing, an anger, a pain. That's it. I trust this enough to believe that what I just said can be taken by the Holy Spirit and bring something entirely new and glorious and bold in your life. And then the life of every face upon which you gaze today. Come to me. 
All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It is such a privilege to be with you today, whether you're here in this space or at home. We are so very grateful, and we pray that, that as we enter into this time of prayer, that you would be overwhelmed by his grace and by his, his loneliness as he, um, as he seeks to be yoked with us. Um, I'm going to ask Jordan to come up uh, and, and share, and as he comes up, just want to remind you about our connection cards. There's a place there on your envelopes here in the sanctuary. If you have a prayer request for us, please let us know so that we can um, be yoked with you and, and, and pray with you. Also, um, if you're at home, there are connection cards right above the live feed. Please fill that out. Let us know how you want us to pray for you. And if you want it confidential, just check that confidential box and only Jim Wood and I will see those. So, um, as we enter into prayer, let's hear about how things are going at Nest and how we can pray. Good morning. How's, <laughs> how's everybody today? We're glad to have you guys here. We're glad to have you guys online as well. And uh, I just wanted to come and give you a quick update. First and foremost, again, we cannot thank you enough for everything that you have done, for all of your time, your talents, gifts, and services in the middle of this nest season as we navigate it. It continues to remain easy because we have support and because we have resources. And so we just thank you for that. Uh, last week I gave you a number. Today I'm gonna give you a name. That name is Plyler Hunter. Some of you guys know him. Uh, some of you guys know his family. He's an amazing and awesome young man, a freshman in Norfolk Academy. Uh, he has had the honor and the privilege as many other young people of coming in here and serving for nest. And because of it, he has been inspired and he's been moved so that he's actually taken this opportunity this year to uh, work on a freshman project and the end of it will be a speech with research entailing homelessness and the history of not just this area specifically but the entire city of Norfolk. That is the kind of heart that has been produced in him and we hope that it's the same kind of heart that's being produced in you to recognize that this is the serious issue that it is. We have been blessed to have everyone here, uh, to have it here throughout the duration of NEST, and hopefully uh, the end result is gonna be the eradication of homelessness. That is the main reason that we do this. And so we love and we honor your continued support, and we will ask that you uh, continue your prayers and also your donations. We asked for belts last week, and guess what? We have too many belts. God bless you. Uh, however, uh, we're going to put out a new ask this week. Uh, we know that we need gloves. We need, I think, men's gloves specifically, but we need gloves all the way around. And so if you can, please send those donations. And I think we might need a blanket or two. I'm not sure. But thank you guys once again for all that you do. And uh, just continue to be reminded of the seriousness of this and also uh, just the heart for Jesus that he had. Uh, for those who are marginalized and on the fringes and just continue that support. Thank you guys so much once again. Thank you, Jordan. And as we lift up Nest, we also lift up the 138 prayer requests through our connection cards, prayers for health and healing for family and friends, for guidance, direction, and clarity, for world peace and reconciliation for our church staff. And, and even uh, we lift up the prayers of Thanksgiving, which we're so excited to have as well. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you and praise you for who you are. Jesus, we know that darkness is as light to you. And so we pray, Lord, that, that we would lean in and hear your words of come to me. Come to me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Lord, we do seek to be yoked with you and move forward with you at your pace. And so we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you for your vision for our lives. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to mold and shape us, to transform our living so that it can be a pleasing sacrifice in our Father's eyes. Lord, we thank you for this day. 
We lift up to you those who are facing surgery and recovering from it. We lift up to you those who are infected with COVID-19. We pray, Lord, for recovery and, um, and, and for uh, restoration. Lord, we thank you for the hospital workers, for healthcare workers, for first responders who are on the front lines um, bringing hope and healing. And so we pray, Lord, that, that you would continue to lift them up and strengthen them. And we thank you for the ability and the responsibility that we have as your image to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And so we do that now in our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit would abide and transform and penetrate and send forth. Hear us as we lift our hearts to you, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Highest praises to the Lord of all. Highest praises to the Lord of all. Oh, highest praises to the Lord of all. To the one.
For you, God, created my inmost being. You knew me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And I pray, Lord Jesus, you, gentle and lowly in heart, would allow me and my family to claim these words today, not just for ourselves, but for all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon and be gracious to the Lord. Turn his face toward you. Yeah.